Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Authorities push back against a stronger dollar while more Fed officials signal a delay to rate cuts. Chip stocks drop into correction as Netflix takes the earnings spotlight later today. And Norway's sovereign wealth fund misses its benchmark on weak results in real estate. We speak to the fund's deputy CEO. A very good morning, but they did splendidly when it came to equities. A bit like everybody else, they've weathered that storm. We'll dig into those numbers in just a moment. Now, we have bounced in these equity markets. The first gain in five days, Danny. So we'll take that as a win. You had the longest slide since January. Max Kettner over at HSBC say that they have gone to overweight equities. This drop in equities for them will be something of a temporary phenomena. Keep an eye on TSMC, the first profit in a year after the assault that came on chips and semiconductors yesterday uh, with the chips moving into correction. TSMC nicely bid this morning up six tenths of one percent. I think I love what Nomura had to say about markets generally. This is not a crash down. It's just that we have got stretched positioning. The Nasdaq up six tenths of one percent today. It's going to be Netflix, Blackstone and L'Oreal. We're going to catch up with Wedbush Securities. What happens next to Tesla? Asian stocks are up by half of one percent because they have more or less had verbal tripartite intervention unleashed from Yellen, South Korea and Japan. What does that mean for the FX markets at the moment? It's a good shot in the arm for equities. Danny, good morning. Good morning, Manis. Finally, there is a bid into bonds. Finally, yields are high and juicy enough for people to jump in. Even the 20-year bond auction yesterday, a tenure that's usually very unloved, second best, second, second strongest demand since it was released in 2020. Really remarkable. So we move lower again in yields, nearly two basis points. We're still above 4.5%. But this is a rally that we haven't seen in quite some time after a 40 basis point move higher in yields. So maybe it is the juicy yield. Certainly doesn't seem to be geopolitics or a haven bid because oil has been moving lower. We're down 0.7% despite the fact that there's still uncertainty in how Israel will respond to the weekend to Iran's attack on Israel. We're back to trading on fundamentals. U.S. stockpiles climbing, hence Brent crude drops lower. We're below $87 a barrel. Manus, you mentioned this trilateral intervention. Is that what is on the cards? We heard from Conda from the Ministry of Finance saying, as he usually does, that they're looking at FX moves. It is a harm to the economy. But what's different this time is that Yellen held a joint press conference with not just Japan, but South Korea, too, does this mean intervention is on the way? But Manis, how will that stick? Because the dollar has been dominating as we have this reappraisal of what the Fed is going to be doing. Yeah, but well, just bear in mind that when it comes to this whole narrative around intervention, back in 2019, China was labeled an FX manipulator. And guess who was on that list as well by the United States of America? It was uh, Japan, followed by South Korea. Uh, we're at the top of those lists of currency manipulators. Far be it from me to say that uh, politics plays a very important. This is about soft power of Asian reach by the mm. United States of America, making sure that we are together, we are aligned, we are your ally. Right. That is the message when it comes to FX. Of course, the irony, stronger dollar helps with inflation, and the U.S. still has an inflation problem, so they don't want to let it weaken too significantly, but maybe tilt to yeah. the hat to Japan and Korea to allow them to jump in and do intervention. Okay, well, we're going to see how that plays out because dollar yen's not exactly shaken up by the whole thing at the moment. So let's see where the money moves to putting the money on the table. Now, we've had the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund underperforming its benchmark for the first quarter with returns coming in short for second consecutive quarter in a row. Trond uh, Grande is the deputy CEO and the chief of staff at Norge Bank Investment Management. He joins Danny and I this morning. Good to see you this morning, sir. So this is the second quarter of underperformance. And we just, if we can just split it down in terms of the areas, obviously equity is very well done. Fixed income and real estate perhaps a little bit more of a drag. I want to focus on fixed income first of all. Where were your biggest losses in fixed income? And everybody's struggling with this. When you see this yield spike, is this the top of the repricing in the bond market? Are you inclined now to take advantage of higher yields to add duration? Well, thanks for having me on. Um, so, you know, we are a long-term investor. We are investing in global equities and global fixed income, 70% uh, equities, 30% bonds. And so um, it's important for us what happens in the, in the interest rate market. Of course, we've seen the rise uh, last year up to 5% on the 10-year uh, treasuries, down to uh, below 4% and now picking up again. So. 
that will have a mark to market effect on our portfolio, but we're not overly concerned about that. I mean, we are, as a long term savings vehicle, it's better for us that interest rates are high, uh, essentially. Right. Uh, and in that, Trond, because the market has done something which you all over at Norges Bank have been talking about anyway, that we had kind of a ridiculous amounts of cuts priced into this market and they had to go and that's what the market is working through and digesting. Do you think the worst of the bond tantrum is now over? Have we finished that digestion and pricing out of cuts? Well, it's hard to say, right? It's, it's changed remarkably in a, in a rather short period of time. I mean, going into this year, we had an expectation of, what was it, six cuts uh, from the Fed this year, and we're now down to two or even below two. So uh, who knows what's going to happen, right? And, uh, and inflation has proven to be a little bit more sticky, maybe, than, than people anticipated. And, and the Fed has said that they will be looking at the data, the hard data, and, uh, and be data-driven in their decision-making. So we'll have to see. How important is it, John, that the next move is a cut? I mean, there's this conversation now arising that the next move could be a hike. And some people have sort of said, look, it is critically important that they put some kind of a cut in because it signals the trajectory of travel. How important is that for markets and risk that the Fed does begin to cut? It, it, it's, it's a good question, right? Because... What we saw in the last few months of, of 23 was a really strong equity market rally. And I would say that was mostly on the back of falling, uh, falling rates. Now, the surprise this year has been, at least in the first quarter, has been the continuation of this bull market. Um, but at the same time, right, uh, rates going up again. So there seems to be a little bit of, a, uh, you know, a, Going, going two ways here. And, and I think increasingly for the equity market, at least, it's going to be uh, the proof of the pudding is going to be the earnings and the earnings season if they hold up to the expectations. Yeah. Uh, and and Tron, really we'll, we'll go back that. to equities in a moment. But we, if we are in this environment where rates are going up again, that's obviously not good for real estate. I know you're a long term investor and this has been a thorn in your side, but the real estate issues are one of long term because you're going to have maturities coming due, not necessarily this year but years to come. So as one private equity executive put it to me yesterday, this is a slow moving train wreck, something that will take five years to unfold with the pain in real estate to really manifest itself. Would you agree with that? Well, uh, so we have a mandate to in invest up to 7% of the fund directly into unlisted real estate. And we're currently just at 2%. And so you're Correct, you know, it has been a tough uh, 24, 36 months even. Uh, but our opinion is that, you know, these, uh, these investments are looking increasingly attractive. Uh, we're not running essentially no, we're essentially running no leverage on our, uh, our uh, real estate. So uh, we will be in a position to actually pick up potentially some good investments in this uh, market environment, even now or going uh, forward a couple of years. And in that area, Tron, where do you want to be exposed? I had HSBC with us saying, look, the worst is passed within commercial real estate. If you are prepared to pick up opportunities, where do you see those opportunities? Well, I think you can see them uh, all, more or less all over, but it's a very different kind of uh, uh, play. You see new emerging sectors like data centers, life sciences buildings, uh, and those uh, things, which are you know long-term attractive investments. Uh, I think they're a little bit uh, so far, not core to our strategy. Our core strategy has been uh, commercial real estate, uh, you know, office mm -hmm. sector and retail. And we will be looking at good opportunities in that space, uh, certainly. John, you mentioned the, the resilience of equities, certainly the resilience of tech, which you mentioned in the release of this results that it was tech that really helped to lift the overall boat. Last time the CEO of Norges Bank Investment Management was on, he said that it was an equal weight allocation to tech. Given the resilience of it, given the AI narrative, which continues to move higher, what would take you to move from an equal weight to bring more on board? Well, I think uh, I think we've been in a position like that for quite a while now. Uh, so this is a super big sector. It has, it has become the biggest sector of our investment portfolio. Uh, but it's also a very uh, expensive uh, market, or a, if not very expensive, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, pretty highly priced. So, uh, so that's why we're being a little bit careful. I mean, there's a lot of merit to the uh, uh, enthusiasm uh, surrounding AI, certainly in the hardware space. But so far, you know, um, 
it, it's to, to be proven how you can monetize it also in the software space. But of course, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, lot of gains priced into the the stocks of uh, Microsoft and Meta uh, on the basis of this. So uh, we're just staying a little bit little bit careful. Is it time to be cautious? Do you think that this is a, a, a very overly concentrated and crowded? Not so much trade. I know that you are a long-term investor, but when you see the herding that is going into this 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 area, do you think it's overcrowded? Is there a bigger risk in stepping into this sector right now? Hard to say, but you know uh, the mere facts is that it has been uh, much more concentrated. Uh, Bet uh, the Magnificent Seven, if they're still called that, uh, make up right like 40% of our equity investment, and that is that is a huge concentration. So obviously, uh, a case to to watch out for, uh, because we want to have a diversified risk taking and a diversified portfolio that we can uh, that can be resilient in in tough mar tougher markets as well. Yeah, resilience the name of the game. Tron, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you so much, Tron Grande of Nordris Bank Investment Management. Okay, let's get to some of the other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. Donald Trump's advisors are pushing to keep a cap on the state and local tax deduction. Economist Stephen Moore and Arthur Laufer say that they are opposed to any increase to the $10,000 write-off cap on salt. That limit was imposed on Trump's 2017 tax law and will expire at the end of 2025. Elon Musk says some of the severance packages sent to the former Tesla employees as part of the biggest ever workforce reduction were too low. In an email, Musk apologized for the mistake and said it's being corrected immediately. Earlier this week, he announced Tesla would slash the global headcount by uh, more than 10% as the car maker struggles with slowing demand for electric vehicles. Micron is posed to get $6.1 billion in grants from the Commerce Department to help pay for domestic factory projects. According to sources, Micron, like Intel and TSMC, will also accept loans as part of the package. The plans are part of a U.S. effort to bring semiconductor production back to American so soil. Well, global chip maker TSMC delivered a better than projected revenue outlook and stuck with the plans to spend more than $32 billion in 2024. The forecast followed its first quarterly profit rise in a year. That's after strong AI demand revived growth at Asia's biggest company. Coming up this hour, chip stocks enter correction territory. We await more tech results. Dan Ives from Wedbush Securities joins Danny and I shortly. But first, up ahead, UBS gears up for, yep, another round of job cuts. We're going to have more on that next on Bloomberg Brief. It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger alongside Manus Cranny in New York. UBS plans to cut 100 positions across its investment banking unit as the firm continues its cost-saving efforts. For more, let's get over to Bloomberg's Jeff Black, who joins us now from Zurich. Jeff, it's, it's yet another round, and it does feel like executives at UBS have little appetite for anyone who's left from Credit Suisse. So how does this, this fit in to the overall job reductions we've already seen? Good morning. Yeah, you're right. Uh, there is a, a pretty constant uh, trimming of positions going on at the investment bank and, and elsewhere. Um, we had uh, some, some quite senior ones uh, in January, mainly in the US. Uh, last month, we saw about 90 uh, in Asia, also in wealth management, um, going. So it's important to bear in mind the, the uh, destination here, which is that UBS wants to cut the uh, Credit Suisse investment bank by about two thirds um, and then integrate what it wants from that uh, into its own um, and move forward. Jeff, good to see you this morning. I mean, if you look at some of the numbers uh, laid out in this story, Credit Suisse was inherited 45,000 extra people, taking the total, total global workforce to 120,000. There is a lot of duplication, even at IB and WM, there is duplication geographically. Do we have any clearer sense? Um, the broader integration of Credit Suisse into UBS, the time it's going to take to unwind a lot of that duplication and the technology overlay. Yeah, well, um, we've already seen that headcount. So you mentioned the 120,000 figure that was down to about 113,000 at the end um, of the last quarter. 
So that's already you know proceeding at pace. Um, a lot of the uh, duplication that's intended to be stripped out is in the investment bank. Um, and uh, the UBS CEO Ermotti has already indicated in what way he, he wants that to go. So it's technology, uh, private equity, it's telecoms. These are the sectors that he's interested in, in uh, building up. And anything that's outside of that, so the riskier trading, derivatives, uh, those types of activities, that's pretty clear that that's in for, for a serious uh, trimming. The overall strategy, as I'm sure you're aware, is that UBS wants to be the world's largest wealth manager. So everything that happens at the investment bank has to fit that goal. Right. And, and I mean, now, as Colm Kelleher said, 2024 is going to be the most difficult year for integration. On top of that, Manis and I talked about earlier this week how Swiss regulators are looking at imposing a potential of, of up to $20 billion capital requirement onto UBS. So put all of this difficulty in context for them. What is the plan? You mentioned some of it, but what is the plan for Colm Kelleher, for Sergio Amati to get UBS through what they've called the most difficult year for them? So they've got to get through the nitty gritty um, of the integration. And a lot of that is, is things like merging IT systems, uh, getting through job losses, figuring out how they're going to uh, merge the uh, operations in Switzerland. That's got a lot of potential for uh, losses that have to be taken up front. So this year is, might be a bit difficult from that point of view. We've got earnings coming up on, on May 7th. But if they can get through this year still intact, then the focus turns to growth. And for investors, uh, the capital returns that they're going to be getting from the new group uh, also in mind that Switzerland wants higher capital requirements. Well, yep, that's the understatement so far of, of quarter two, isn't it, Jeff? <laughs> Switzerland <laughs> want a little bit more capital requirements, somewhere between 15 and 25 billion uh, Swiss francs. Jeff, thank you very much. Let's see how that capital requirement uh, plays out in Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich uh, with the very latest on UBS. Jeff, thank you very much. Quick snapshot of what's going on in the bond market, Danny. Uh, yields ticking down ever, ever so slightly. Down a tick. You'd hardly call that a move. I mean, there was a nice 20 year auction yesterday yeah. in the United States. It was well bid. Um, Facebook moderating wage pressure yeah. again. It's not, it's, you're right, it's sort of more meh. We, but we never care about the beige book. Is that well, sacrilegious to say? I don't it's know. Always... You've just cut me down in frames. <laughs> there you go. I don't know. It was, it, was, it was written up as being the moderating wage, wage pressures. And that, I think that's what people are focused yeah, on. Yeah, sure. Any nuance on wages. And that plays to PCE. And, and, but part of this is also just, you know, yields are, are at really juicy levels. We fell eight basis points yesterday. And, and, and Manus, I do think... As you say, the 20-year bond auction is notable. This is usually an auction that doesn't go well. This is usually a tenor that people don't care about. This was the second strongest demand for this bond yeah. auction since it returned in 2020. I think that's really saying something. Yields look good and people want to jump in. Well, we just had a conversation with Norge Bank and in terms of them, they're long-term players, but that's where they took their point of pain. But so did everybody take their pain in the bond market. Yes. The question is, does real money come in on 10s, 20s and 30s? Citigroup say you are wrong to think it's only two cuts. Follow you. 125 basis points. City are still in there. Yeah. The question is, is the bond turmoil over? Do we have still more cuts to price out? A lot of questions and we'll have more of them here on Bloomberg Brief. It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Kearney alongside Danny Berger in New York. Now, are you ready for Japan, South Korea and the United States? A tripartite agreement to watch the FX markets really closely this is what we understand. There was a statement mm. signed by Yellen along with her cohorts from Japan and South Korea. And essentially it was, we're watching the FX markets. But right. this is about politics as well as FX, which right. is the U.S. reaching across and saying, look, we're with you to the Asian currencies, which have been demolished this year. Right. I mean, it's, it's written up as a nod, basically saying we understand and we sympathize with the weakness in your currencies. That is her implicitly saying... The U.S. will be okay if you intervene in your currencies. That's not necessarily a trilateral intervention, but it opens the door to it. Now, it is notable, though, that the market has not responded to it. You can see the end there. Yeah, you've decided now it's not responded. No, but it, but the the truth of the matter is. Is it what you were saying? It was is that traders aren't no nervous. 
because they don't think that it can possibly alter the outlook for the yen. The view in FX markets is that unilateral intervention in of itself, whether it's, ver whether it's verbal or whether it's with cash, does not do the job. Uh, and uh, Jane Foley is going to be with us on Monday, but she's, she sent us this. Um, remember 2019, it was the U.S. that put Japan, South Korea underneath China on their watch list. So this is about politics as well. And you're going to need... Rate differentials are absolutely going to hold mm. firm for dollar yen. Yeah. So you're going to need some radical shake-up there before you get a move. Yeah. It could also just be fatigue. I mean, how many times have we heard from Japan in terms of we're watching the currency, we're concerned about the currency weakness? It could, it could be down to that too. Could indeed. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about markets and how brave you feel. We've got Michael Purvis from Tolbarkin Capital in the studio. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Anna Scranny in New York. And I'm Danny Berger. Here's what you need to know. Authorities push back against a stronger dollar while Fed officials signal a delay to rate cuts. Chip stocks drop into correction as Netflix takes the earnings spotlight later today. And Norway's sovereign wealth fund misses its benchmark and weak results in real estate. We caught up with the fund's deputy CEO. Of course, equities really saved the man, as, as, yep. as it has saved a lot of asset managers. So would you really go into bonds with the sell-off, or do you stick with your guns with the equity world? Well, his answer to that was, of course, that they are long-term investors. But he did, he did actually talk about the concentration risk in tech. Yes. They are exposed to tech. They have a significant exposure to tech. I think you said it was, what, equal weight? Yeah, it, well, it's equal weight, and he said it remains so. But it certainly hasn't been the year of bonds. Not for them, not for this overall no. market, but we're finally dipping our toe back in, Manus. Let me show you what we're doing this morning. Because yields are ticking lower for a second day. Not by a huge amount, but we moved lower by eight basis points yesterday. No huge catalyst. Again, maybe it was just yields are finally juicy enough. They were above 4.6%. We're below it this morning. We did add a 20-year auction that went extremely well. Again, rare for a tenor that people usually don't like. Brent crude also moves lower, down 7 tenths of 1%. We're above $86 a barrel. Geopolitics still uncertain, but the trade maybe is more on fundamentals and growing U.S. stockpiles. Finally, dollar yen. We've talked this to death, Manus. But again, little move. Moved. We did have the possibility of trilateral intervention. Yellen giving a statement alongside officials from Japan and South Korea. Is that's what next on the cards? And our traders prepared for that possibility? How could you not talk more about dollar yen? <laughs> You'll be crying we whenever they go for that intervention. Then you go, we cannot <laughs> talk enough about it. Uh, equities are bouncing back from a two-month low. The chips went into a correction. TSMC came out uh, and said, actually, we've got our first profit rise in a year. We just caught up with the Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, of Norway. Of course, they have a high commitment in the AI space, uh, and they are committed to that in terms of real estate. Also, uh, they're going to see opportunities. When there are opportunities in commercial real estate, they're going to jump into that. S&P 500, you've got HS. BC uh, moving to an overweight on equities. The drop in equities for them will be short term. Nomura say this, that these equity markets which have dropped, it's a, not a crash down, it's merely stretched position. And again, that was reconfirmed by the conversation with Norge Bank as well. Today, Netflix, Blackstone and L'Oreal uh, deliver. I popped the Asian markets up there because there is this response mechanism, not only in the currencies, but also in the equity side as well, uh, on this tripartite v uh, intervention statement from uh, the US. It's not a statement on intervention, but it's almost a tacit nod by the U.S. to Korea and to Japan. Should they wish to step in, they have the free reign to possibly do that. Danny. So I didn't want to talk too much about the end because I wanted to leave it to you, Manus. It was my, it was my gift. That's, that's what that was. <laughs> no, but on, on this idea, uh, as we're talking about the deputy CEO of Norges Bank, that he likes tech, but he doesn't want to get more into it because it's too expensive. A lot of folks feel that way, but that doesn't hold them back. The latest fund manager survey from Bank of America, their title, which I know you'll like, was Pretty Fully Bully. It was the most bullish fund manager survey since January 2022. They say, look, the bullish sentiment is not quite close your eyes and sell, but it poses a real issue for risk assets because we're more vulnerable to bad news than we are good news right now. Yeah, but we, can, we, we see that. We see that on a daily basis. Mm. As soon as there's anything uh, askew in any of these tech, MAG6, MAG7, we'll yeah. talk more about Tesla a little bit later on, but the slightest hint uh, of disruption in the narrative and there is an immediate puncturing yes. of risk. No, really well put. Now, our, our next guest talks about that as well. He writes yeah. that we continue to think we're in for consolidation and perhaps something more painful. It's time for thoughtful defense. Joining us now is the ever-thoughtful Michael Purvis, CEO and founder of Talbeck and Capital Advisors. 
Michael, great to see you. Thanks for coming in so early this morning. Good morning. Um, look, in a world where both equities and bonds continue to sell off in tandem, what is thoughtful defense? Well, I think right now you have to think about uh, just within the equity book, right? Um, we've seen a situation where whatever sell-offs we've had have been really kind of driven a little bit more by, um, as you were just saying, you know, like, oh, is, this, is the story off? Like Tesla, for example, right, right? there. Um, I think what, what could happen here, and again, broadly speaking, I've been very constructive um, for a while now on the economy. Um, I think it's going to be rate resistant um, uh, to a de largely uh, speaking and so forth. But we are, I think, due for a consolidation. I'll get into that in a little bit sure. uh, there. But you know, you asked the question about defense there. Uh, look, I think, I think right now you got to think about um, if you are going to just de-risk, simply going to cash like near-term bills are still paying it really you know it's still not a bad place to park right um, if you're getting five percent on your cash there so I think that's sort of an obvious thing and I else I've been advocating for um, uh, you know getting long VIX through mm. VIX calls for some time um, the VIX has come up uh, here we are getting into a more robust cross asset volatility picture from you know Treasury vol to equity vol to oil vol gold vol and so forth is it too late to hedge well, yeah, it's not as good as it was back when the VIX was. Or maybe back the type of question is: Is it too there, late to hedge? And if you were going to hedge, no. what would you use? Well, I, I think you have to be always careful with hedging with options when you know when when vol has been pushed up here, right? Yeah. You can lose money on, on premium yeah. pretty quickly. And, and and when I'm saying defense, look, I I'm not talking about some massive sell-off here. I'm talking, you know. Like I think there could be further downside, uh, an overdue sort of you know late winter hangover I call it. Uh, that's you know maybe down to 4,800 on the S&P 500 there, right? Mm -hmm. So that okay. kind of thing. I'm not talking about 4,300 yeah. or 4,000. I'm not talking about like head for the hills apocalypse. So, so, so what, are, what are you? <laughs> well, I don't. Good. I don't have another apocalypse left in me. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'll be grateful does, right? for 4,800. Yeah, we've had Thank too many you very much. Apocalypses in our lifetime. Okay, so if we are heading down, is that a just buy every dip? Kind of. Well, yeah. When, I, I think when you, I, I think look, I, my my view on like how thinking about buying the dip and like we are just getting going on the earnings season here, but we are in a in a situation where it's really about if the stock's going to generate earnings above expectations or you think it's going to be generating earnings above expectations, that's uh, and the earnings are there. That's going to stock stock's going to get bought mm. and more so uh, during the dip. I think if we, you know, we had some geopolitical jitters over the weekend, and if if those were to resume, and we got more of that pan asset de-risking where the VIX is at 30, um, that's where you're going to see the winners indiscriminately get sold more so than the laggards there, right? So, you know, if if I look, you took, you mentioned Mag Six there. The Mag Six was up uh, at least through Friday was up about 22 uh, percent year to date. Mm. You know, compare that with the SPX equal weight, it was at the time was up 4 percent year to date. The fundamentals, I would argue, are better for the MAG-6 than they were for the SPX equal weight, just simply that the earnings growth had, was was 18% for the mm. MAG-6 from the mm -hmm. beginning of the year. That's very impressive, right? And I'm like follow the earnings. But the caveat to that is that if we get this indiscriminate selling, um, what went up the most will get sold the most, right? And we haven't seen that in, in quite some time. And I think that goes back to what Nomura was saying, which this is not a crash down. This is just stretch positioning. Mm. And stretch positioning in nervous geopolitical times yeah. can, can be pressed. Um, I'm just looking at the oil price at the mo at, at this morning. There's a couple of interesting things going on in oil. Gas demand has taken a bath. You're also seeing cushion inventories. Let me just get the right facts. I'm just curious in, in terms of what you think. Yeah. Fuel demand, I, this really shocked me. Fuel demand in this country it's the lowest since 1999. Inventories at Cushing are at the highest level since yeah. June. I was actually really, really shocked when I read those numbers. But you look at the oil market up 14% and change here in the United States of America. Where is that most injurious? To Biden in the polls in gas or in the Fed's complex for inflation? Or, or all of the above. I mean, it, it's, look, I, I think, um, True. Look, look, we have had an oil sell-off. There was a geopolitical premium that was maybe, uh, uh, in hindsight, overpriced uh, here. And you come into those 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 inventory numbers you were just describing yep. there. But look, I think there is a broader story here that, that, that there was a quiet rally in crude from $67 up into the you know, the, the, the middle 80s here, um, there. And if you look at, you know, get, you know Powell bottom ticked crude in the, that December FOMC meeting, right? I mean, you know, there was a, that Q4 feeling of disinflation is here, rah, 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 we're getting to 2%, all's good. 
And here we are, you know, the summer drives around the more, uh, around the corner. We have the SBR, um, uh, it's not filled up, right? It's still at, at, at especially low levels uh, there. And there is, a, there is really a potential for oil to rise higher. Now, just speaking, getting back to that cross-asset sort of yeah. condition for a second, the thing I've been concerned about is, if you, if you remember the Treasury sell-off back in September and October, that was really driven a lot by term premium. It really mm -hmm. wasn't about hikes. It really wasn't a, a, um, about uh, commodities rallying. It was about term premium. This time around, it's been really coinciding with higher copper prior, prices, higher gasoline prices, right. oil prices, and so forth, and of course, other other things have been upside have been upside surprises on the inflation side. But what if oil does pop back another 10 or 15, 20 dollars in Q2, and that re-aggravates the Treasury sell-off there? And that, to me, is how you get you might get that 10-year back to that 5 percent level, and that's how you might get that scary pan right. ask at risk. And I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying this is a risk I'm very focused on. Right. Well, that risk also ties into this idea that the volatility we've seen as of late is across asset volatility. Right. It's not necessarily exactly. confined to one sector. But as I say that, I mean, the VIX, sure, it popped over the past week, but it's yeah. still below 20. Yep. So when you're talking about cross-asset volatility picking up, if it is more highly correlated, if it's oil, treasuries, yep. and the VIX, is this a regime shift, finally, that takes volatility to the highs that it used to trade at when we were nervous yeah. in this market? Well, look, you know, I, I think that's a, great, that's a great point, a great question. I do think the VIX is going to normalize to a higher level. If you go back to the late 1990s, you had a great equity market. Right, and that the VIX averaged considerably higher. I think the VIX average VIX for the last three years of the 90s was around uh, 20 or so. Right, we we've been used to thinking about bull mark bull equity markets back in, you know, the 2010 to 2019 period with like a super low VIX. Right there, but equities can rally with a higher VIX, and I do think if you're going back to a more earnings driven equity condition. That will come inherently with a higher VIX there, then as opposed to, oh, my God, the Fed's easing, 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 so we have to get, you know, sell vol, sell vol, right. sell vol, right? I think she's just secretly writing put options out there somewhere. <laughs> That's I don't think she, I'm allowed to do that. I don't that. think she's allowed to do that. I don't think any of us are allowed to do that. But you're right, equities can survive in a higher volatility yeah. regime, and it's just understanding and getting used to that. And I think we, we yeah. slowly, slowly, slowly are. Yeah. Maybe I'm overstating it. Yeah. Michael, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Our guest this morning uh, on markets, that is Michael. The purpose of Talbach and Capital Advisors. Coming up in the show, Danny and I, we're going to catch up with Dan Ives on Wedbush. Mag 6, Mag 7, what does he really think about Tesla? There's a lot of merit to the uh, uh, enthusiasm uh, surrounding AI, certainly in the hardware space, but so far, you know, um, it, it's to, to be proven how you can monetize it also in the software space. That's John Grande, Deputy CEO at Norway's Wealth Fund, speaking to Danny and myself just a little bit earlier on their tech exposure. Well, the chip market, including NVIDIA, ended a technical correction, raising concerns whether the rest of the tech markets will follow suit. Dan Ives, is with us from Wedbush Security. Dan, good morning. Good to Great see to you. Be here. Volatility. I mean, you've got to be sort of kind of brave to hang on to the desk and sort of go, whoa, it's, it's, it's like a roller coaster ride with NVIDIA, with chips, ASML. I mean, different, different bombs drop in this technology sector. How stoic do you need to be? How much do I need to believe that the earnings will trump emotional volatility in this market? Good morning. Great to be. Yeah, I mean, like, look, it comes down to, to earnings. And I think the next few weeks, this is a get out the popcorn moment for tech. And you're going to see chips, AI revolution, enterprise, consumer on the digital side, I think Google, Meta, and others. I think this is really going to be a flex the muscles moment for tech. So my view is no doubt white knuckles, many yelling fire in a crowd theater on tech. I think we sit here four, six weeks from now, look at this more of a golden buying opportunity rather than the time that was something more structural. And you think the earnings are going to show up. And I got to say, given that NVIDIA is 11.5% lower for the top, I mean, if you are bullish on tech and you're expecting earnings to turn out, this seems like an incredible opportunity. Look, that's look, our view in over, whatever, 25 years, hand-holding, it's through the choppiness and the volatility 
That's why all the work we do traveling around the world in Asia, understanding what the supply chain looks like, what demand is. And I think, look, a few quarters ago, it was choppier in terms of enterprise and what we saw in terms of overall spending. But now, the monetization of that AI revolution, it's happening. And it's not just about godfather of AI, Jensen and NVIDIA, and of course, what Redmond and Nadella are doing. Now it's, it's everyone else. You look at what's gonna be happening with Palantir, Google, Amazon, I think the rest of the software names like MongoDB, Salesforce, and others. I love what you wrote about Microsoft. It's the iPhone moment yes. for Microsoft. <laughs> I mean, that, that's tantalizing. So just, just build on that narrative for us. I mean, for Microsoft, when the Dell is done, we're talking Mount Rushmore Hall of Fame, and they're building a statue of them right now. Revan, because <laughs> when it comes to AI, mm -hmm. open AI, and you look at Copilot, this is really the start of the next growth story at Microsoft. Look, we think from all of our checks, for every hundred dollars of spending- Have they got a moat? Are they so far ahead? Have they got a barrier to entry against everybody else? It's like Mahomes is a quarterback versus everyone else in terms of NFL. And, and, what, and what you really have here is that Microsoft is the top of that mountain. Google, they're gonna gain share. Amazon, this is not a zero sum game. So you're gonna have what we've used a trillion dollars of spend over the next decade. And Danny, it speaks to my point. It's very easy in these near term periods to be like, that's it, tech, it's expensive. But it goes back to expensive. I'll pay up for the Bugatti in the left lane rather than owning the minivan that needs a paint job with no radio in the right lane going right. 30 miles an hour. I really wish we had a camera on Manus's face when you mentioned Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> I, re I really wish we did. It's because oh. it's Manus's favorite team. He's a big fan of the Chiefs. It's called the cultural curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll get there. We'll, get, we'll get him sped up, Dad. I mean, but look, it, we are in this moment. I was saying this during the break is I feel schizophrenic that every day I look at NVIDIA and say, wow, it's holding up really well as yields are going higher. And then the next day I'm thinking, wow, NVIDIA, we're finally selling it. Does does it seem, though, that there's been a sentiment shift on the overall investor and the willingness to hold their nose and buy NVIDIA? And for you, is that maybe even a good thing? Yeah, look, and you talk about, you know, a great job in the show in terms of the 10-year, 5%, that hurts tech. You know, it's almost a Groundhog Day 2022. But this is different because of ultimately, if you look at the growth in tech, unless you have a telescope, it's hard to find the recession. And when you look at what's happened from an AI perspective, this is a fourth industrial revolution that's happened right now, a 1995 moment. I'm not saying we're not gonna have pullbacks, especially Fed speak, everything we're seeing, cuts, that, but at the end of the day in tech, if, you have, if you're able to see forest through the trees, that's really where the money's been made in tech, rather than, look, right now, New York City cab drivers bearish and some of these high growth names going into earnings. You say that the spend in information technology, in AI, will be around 8 to 10%. So you say that AI and related purchases will comprise 8 to 10% of IT budgets. So if you're not in NVIDIA, if you're not in Broadcom, I mean, maybe you should have an allocate, obviously an allocation to them. But where is the breadth in tech? We talk about breadth in markets, reaching for breadth mm -hmm. in markets. But where is a better breadth play in tech outside MAG7? Well, I think it's in software. And right now, and the baton is being handed from semis to software. Because if you look, the use cases, Salesforce, ServiceNow, yeah. Oracle, Microsoft. If someone told you six months ago, Dell is going to be an AI play, they say, ooh, I want what, what he's having or she's having. So the point is, <laughs> when, when you now start to That's see- That's a bit harsh on Dell, is it? But, but you, look, but you start to see what's happening now with AI. It's not just about Godfather of AI, Jensen, NVIDIA, and Microsoft. We're spreading the monetization. That tidal wave's coming to tech. And I get it. If you want to sell tech because 10 year goes up 50 bips, mm. that, you know, that, that's, that, that's the nature of the beast. But it goes back to this is what I view as a 1995 moment, right. not a 1999 moment. And, and a, a, a clear difference between the two. If, if you're looking to bet on AI as a long term, one company in particular that that's been thrown into question recently is Tesla, with Elon Musk essentially saying, either give me this pay package or I take my AI elsewhere. What do you do with that, Dan? Well, if you looked up disaster in the dictionary right now, you'd see Tesla the last three to four months. Because look, for, you need an adult in the room. And for Musk, we could talk pay packages, the Delaware comp issue. We're talking about train wreck deliveries and what's really been mixed messages in terms of I'll take my AI elsewhere, 
Model 2, that's a key part, Magnus and I talk, that's a key yeah. part of the growth story for the next few years. Next week, we're talking about a moment of truth for Musk and Tesla with patients wearing extremely thin here. You say that the clock has struck midnight for Musk to lay out a growth strategy and give realistic delivery and margin goals. That's essentially um, what, what you have said. Um, to discuss why significant layoffs now and most importantly, give a clear outlook to the street around Model 2. Now, we were in makeup this morning. That's the kind of way that we roll on the 5 a.m. Takes a lot of work to get, this, to, get, to get this truck on the road in the morning. Just describe to me what is at play with Model 2 if it's ditched? It changes the growth story. It, it, it historically would change the growth story. Now, everyone make autonomy, robo-taxis five, six years from now. We're talking right now, you're at the edge of a cliff. It's for Musk to bring it back fork in the road, navigate through this Category 5 storm. If you all say robo-taxis, five-year, the cult crew, everyone, that's what they're focused on, you ditch Model 2, this would be a historic disaster gamble that could change the future of Tesla in terms of dark days ahead. And that's why this is really, this is why you not compare clock struck midnight, fork in the road, it's next Tuesday. Well, Dan, you got an outperform still on Tesla. Would you change it? Longer term, we're bullish in terms of the Tesla story. But as we've talked about, there, this is the period for Musk. Lay it out. Don't just talk, talk. Walk the walk. Because the benefit of the doubt's not there. Yeah. And this has gone from a Cinderella story to essentially Friday the 13th. Well, well that's the note we're going to end it on. A brutal <laughs> note. <laughs> it's <laughs> gone from Cinderella to what? Friday the 13th? Friday the 13th. Well, Nightmare on Elm put Street. It, pick your... Put it on a T-shirt. <laughs> put it on a T-shirt. Dan, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. We really always appreciate it. Dan Ives of Wedbush. Okay, coming up, more FedSpeak and Netflix. All of that on deck. It's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger and Manus Cranny in New York. Let's get you set up for your trading day. We're going to have a slew of economic data. Initial jobless claims come out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Existing home sales at 10 a.m. Then more Fed speak. John Williams, Michelle Bowman, Raphael Bostic all throughout the day. Then after the bell, Manus, it's Netflix up to report earnings. Yep, I'm sure we can uh, almost pre-write the narrative there, which is let's wait and see, get more confidence. Micro movers for you this morning. Micron getting six billion bucks, excuse me, uh, in a Chips Act grant next week, according to reporting by Bloomberg. NVIDIA uh, also on the up. TSMC's outlook beating forecasts, giving AI a nice boost. There's the spoos at the bottom of the page. Danny, up an eighth of 1%. We're breaking five days of a brutal sell-off. Yep, finally some reprieve this morning. But will it last? Bond yields also charting lower. Surveillance will take it from here. That's it for your brief.